Good to see you guys. If we haven't met yet, my name is Andy, and I love coming to the chapel here. It is a great to see you I have a privilege to be the pastor of the Crosspoint Network of Churches, but uh, today I'm privileged to be focused on what's going on in the life here at, uh, at this place, in this college, with these students, and I am overwhelmed with my joy at being able to uh, present and speak with you guys. I want to begin by just an overarching statement because I need to move quickly through what we're going to do today, a character study that I hope will bless you. But uh, have you ever realized that we don't learn from our past mistakes? Anybody ever been there? That you tend to make the same mistakes again and again? And I just don't understand that. I think it's just a part of who we are. Last January, my family and I were coming back from an Oklahoma trip and uh, we had kind of uh, pulled the rug out from under the kids. It was supposed to be more of a fun trip, ended up being a family dysfunction trip. You ever been to Dysfunction Junction? <laughs> One of those. And so on the way back, we do what dysfunctional families do. We decide to materially reward them so that they, because it's part of that cycle of codependence. Anyway, we played right into it. Uh, we stopped at All-Star Sports to make up for a bad weekend with the in-laws. And uh, uh, we're there and bought pocketfuls of uh, tokens for them to play games, ride go karts, all that kind of stuff. And I wasn't really enjoying it because I'm the keeper of the tokens. That's my job. Because if you give them to them, they can burn through like 150 tokens in like 10 minutes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But if you doiled them out just a little by little. So I'm the keeper of the tokens, which is a boring job, by the way. When you get to that place where you're the keeper of the tokens, Chuck E. Cheese ain't so much fun anymore. I just want you to know that. So as I'm keeping the tokens, I look up at the snack bar. They have uh, an icy machine, not a fake slushy machine from Quick Shop, but a real genuine polar bear with no pants on icy machine right there. <laughs> I don't know, man, I have not had me a cherry icy in a long time. And, and so I, I took a few tokens up there and I spent them on me, splurged on myself, got me. And I didn't even get a small one. I got a big daddy one right there, big old icy. And I'm following the boys around, doling out the tokens, and drinking my icy, just loving life, man. This is good. I have, and I'm just drinking. I'm at the Papa shot, and Nathan is getting ready to set a high score, so I got excited. What happens when you get excited and you're drinking an icy? Well, what's the rule for drinking an icy, by the way? Drinking slow. When you get really excited, you're like, oh man, oh yeah, this is slow. And then all of a sudden, you know that moment right before the brain freeze that almost kills you? <laughs> that moment when you go, oh no. <laughs> you can like feel it crawling around the back of your head. You're like, I'm going to die right now. <laughs> I feel it. And I felt, oh, the most horrific brain freeze. I mean, everybody says they're really bad. I've had really bad ones. I've had catastrophic ones. I ain't never had anything. Like I had an all-star sports on that day, because I'm, I'm apparently, I drink like happy, get a name, you know, and then all my friends are like, I will punish you, and here it comes. <laughs> it hurt so bad, I stepped away and kind of got into a shadowy corner over there, where there was some, some darkness, not maybe some darkness to help migrate people, I'll try that real quick. And, oh, it started to hurt so bad, I did, it hurt so bad, my chest started to hurt. I thought... I've done it. I have killed myself with a slushie. That's right. My heart is going to seize up. I got down on one knee at All-Star Sports, clutching my slushie in one hand, making deals with God. You know you're desperate. You said, God, please just care for my children when I'm gone. You think I'm joking. I literally thought, I care. I'm, gonna, I'm having a hemorrhage, an aneurysm, and a heart attack. It's all happening right now. My 14-year-old walked up beside me, put his hand on my shoulder, said, Dad, you okay? Try to get up. Yeah, I'm fine. He moved on. He did not care that much. <laughs> he still had tokens. He was fine. After a couple of minutes, my heart stopped. See, I mean, I'm breaking out in sweat. I'm just dying. My heart kind of, I can hear it beating again. I think I might live. And I get to open one eye, and I'm still seeing black shooting dots. And I get back on my feet. And you know what the first thing I did was? I took another stick and drink that slushie. I wasn't even thinking, I was like, oh man, that was bad. What are you doing? Can anybody feel me on this? Right there? We, we've been maybe not with a slushie, but with so many other areas of life, we go, oh, I never do this guy, I don't want to be. And then and we find ourselves in that same pattern of behavior. You know, one of the reasons that we're given characters in the Bible is not just to convey the message, but we're allowed to identify with characters. And when we stop, most of us view ourselves as superheroes. I mean, we would never say that out loud, but we're stronger, that will never happen to us, we won't fall down there, that's what other people do. But when we start to see ourselves, when we look at God's word as a mirror, and we begin to see those characters and say, you know what, that flaw, I see in me. That failure, I've walked through. 
then we begin to understand that we are just like the people of God came to say. We're not above it. We're not below it. We are those people. And so I want to read a story to you, a familiar story to you. And your job, if I say my job, <laughs> your job is to identify yourself in the story. There are going to be some characters in this, but your job is simply to look. I, if you take notes and you like them, that's fine. But I'm not going to even ask you to write anything down. I just want you to find yourself in this story. I'm going to read you the story, and then we're going to go back and talk about the different characters. Sound good? So if you have your Bible and want to follow along, I'm in Mark chapter 15. This is a, a story surrounding Christ's tribe. And uh, before we get there, I'm going to show you a series of pictures today. Let me show you the backdrop picture that we're going to look at. This is a picture from Jesus in his judicial phase. And of course, you have some characters that we're going to display as I read through this. And, and I'll direct you back to this photo in a few moments. Let me read this for you. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 1, it says, And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests and held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how, they, how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner from whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call king of the Jews? And they cried out, Crucify him! And Pilate said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now remember what your job is? You've got to find yourself in the story. There are several characters I want you to pick from. The first character in the story is going to be coming, and will come into focus here. His name is Jesus. I want to give you a little hint. You're not him. <laughs> That one pretty easy. We're done with that. Of, of all the characters in this, I said, well, but don't we have Christ in our heart? We have a little bit of Christ. Yeah, give all new age all you want and soft, and, and let's all hug and sing kumbaya. Well, let me just help you out with this. You ain't Jesus. You are a sinful, broken, flawed human being. Look at every sitting next to him and go, he's talking to you. <laughs> you know how I know? Because I'm one too. I'm a human being. I'm sinful. I'm flawed. I thank God for the grace of Jesus. And if it wasn't for Jesus and what he went through on the cross and what he did at the grave and when he came back in the resurrection, but wasn't for that, if he wasn't the original grave robber, if he wasn't the murdered champion, if he wasn't the, the victim that was a victor, if he wasn't all that, then we would not have a reason to be here today. But just know this, as awesome as he is, as amazing as the story is, that's not you. That's not you. One more time, what's your name go? That's not you. Go ahead and tell him. Not you. Now there's a second character in the story that you may be. Bring him into focus. That's Pilate. I have a lot of sympathy for Pilate. I know that he's considered by history to be a uh, reprobate and, uh, and, uh, and just an evil person, but I just have a lot of sympathy for him. And why? He was put in a tough spot. He was asked to be the judge. Everybody say judge. Uh, asked to be a judge. He was asked to make the decision between right and wrong without all the information. Have you ever made the decision what was right or wrong based on your limited information? Have you ever decided whether someone else was right or wrong, or you were right, or you were wrong? Or... I, I think we just get in that spot, and, and we hate that when other people do it, but we love it when we do it. When I was in college, my uh, English comp class for a freshman, comp 101, there was a, I, I like writing. My, my actual degree is not in ministry, it's in journalism, and uh, I really appreciate uh, language arts. And so when I heard that there was one professor you wanted to avoid because he was just horrific, he's the guy who sought out. Because I wanted to be challenged because I'm apparently a little sick in the head in that direction. And I went into Mr. Mead's class. Yes, I'm going to say his name. I'm going to say it right now. Mr. Mead's class, and I'm mad at him. Can I just tell you from the get-go of this story? Anyway, I took this class, and I was breezing through it, man. I 
got A, 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 B, A, A, and uh, it was all on themes and thesis. And we got to the end, and it was the biggest project, and I turned it in, a big research project, and I got back a week before classes were out, and I got my paper back, and on the top of the paper it said A, scratched out, D plus. And I said, can I ask you a question? He goes, I'm not taking questions, you have to meet me in my office. So I followed him down to his home. And he turns around and says, can I help you? No, I was like, never mind, yes. Uh, I just want to know about this paper. I, I, I got a D plus, and it had a name. He goes, oh, yes, excellent paper. So why the D plus? He goes, oh, because I didn't want to give you an A. I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, you didn't have to work as hard as everybody else. This was too easy for you. If you'd have done better work than this, then I'd have given you the A for the A for the class. But since you need to get at least a B in the class, I had to give you a D on the paper. Have a nice day. Would that take anybody else home? <laughs> I marched straight over to the dean's office, and I filed for academic clemency, and I had a hearing before the board, and I had a meeting with the vice president, and, and I had a sit down with him, and at the end of it, do you know what they said? He's the teacher. M-E-A-D-E, -E, Mr. Me. <laughs> Sometimes you get put in that spot where you can make the decisions. Matter of fact, you know what? Over your life, you know the whole pro choice, pro, -choice, pro life debate? <laughs> What's the debate? Everybody makes their own choices. Everybody makes their own choices. The question is are you a qualified judge? I mean, I really pity Tyler. And I pity most of us because we have to make hard decisions. Who am I going to marry? What school am I going to go to? Do I choose to follow Christ? Am I going to follow something else? Am I going to follow the steps of my parents? What am I going to do? We have limited information and we get so stuck. I'll bet if you look hard enough, you could probably see your face in the face of Pilate. You know, he wasn't just a judge, but he was also an appeaser. It says, in order to satisfy the crowd. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but have you ever made a decision, not because you wanted to make a decision, but because everybody else made that decision? And the answer is yes, we've all been to junior high. And when the crowd wants something, even though he didn't want to go, do you understand the stress he was under? His wife came to him and said, don't do anything to this man. Why? I had a dream. The gods are going to kill us if you do something to this man. And he's like, there's nothing wrong with him. I've tested him. I'm asking questions. He's a nice guy. And, and everybody on the inside was just the chief priest making the crowd go crazy. And in order to satisfy the crowd, let me just say this. If you have ever made a decision to do what you knew was not right or go with the flow, even though you were uncomfortable with it, then you got a little bit of pilot inside of you. Let's go to the next character. We have to actually flip the camera around. I want you to see from behind what they were looking at. Now let me bring into focus one part of this over here with the chief priest. The priest. Everybody say priest. priest. The priests were difficult. They were manipulators. They were users. They were afraid. You say, boy, I'm glad that that's not me. I'm definitely not one of those guys. Really? I bet some of us can find our face in that crowd as we manipulate. Yeah, I was at a church in Oklahoma not too long ago, my wife's family church. And I'm not, I, I love, we have a large church, we're multi-site kind of contemporary, so people think I hate old church. I love old world church. I think it's fun. I think it's the backbone of America. I think small churches where everybody knows everybody and the piano's out of tune and nobody can sing, I think that is the way Jesus founded the church, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think Peter could sing. You know what I'm talking about? It's, anyway, I, I love that. So I'm not dogging on that, but every now and then you get a real personality in that environment. And at this little Oklahoma church, I've been there several times, Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence is so old, I think he helped write the Gospels. You understand <laughs> that? I mean, he knew G when they said suffer the little children, that was Brother Lawrence. They were <laughs> You've been around a long time. And Brother Lawrence leads worship, and this is how he does it. Going to the 197. Let's express our joy to the Lord. <laughs> and you got to love him because he's been there forever. You know what I mean? He's been there forever. And he gets up, he leads the hymns, he leads the invitation. And their pastor, he's a bivocational guy. He's so sweet. I mean, he's, he's, he's not really a great preacher, but he always has amazing stuff to say. And if you come with an open heart, you're going to learn. And I take notes. I steal the stuff. Come back to the lecture preaching. You know what I mean? It's just good stuff. 
But we were there for that. So he'd been preaching for about 20 minutes, and I saw Brother Lawrence get up from where Justin is over here. He had his hymnal. Pastor's full on preaching, and Brother Lawrence gets behind the podium with him, stands right next to him, and goes like this. <clears throat> And push the pastor out. <laughs> and the pastor said, Well, I guess it's time for the invitation. And I don't have a poker face, I'm in the back row. <laughs> Did that just happen? Well, I was grabbing my leg, be quiet. Oh, I can't believe that just happened. The brother Lord says, Who's in charge? Brother Lord is in charge. Ah, in charge. <laughs> I was amazed. Brother Lord somebody else take the fall for you, you got a little bit of the priest inside of you. If you have ever gotten somebody to do what little brothers and sisters, gotten somebody to do what you didn't want to do so you could get out of it, you got a little bit of the priesthood in you. You know, they did it primarily because they were afraid. Everybody say afraid. afraid. They were afraid that if you really wasn't the side, they'd lose their job. They were afraid if you really wasn't the side, you would shake things up. If you have ever done what you needed to do just to maintain the status quo, because you ain't letting somebody come in here and shake up your apple cart, then you can probably find your face in that crowd. I, I gotta hurry. take your attention over here. Not to the priest, but oh, look at there. to the rest of the crowd. Everybody say the crowd. Yeah. I gotta make a statement for you, and I want you to hear this. People are smart. Crowds are stupid. Can I say that one more time? People are smart. Crowds are stupid. I want you to say it with me. Breathe it in. Here we go. People are smart. Crowds are stupid. This is the same crowd that one week was going before was Jesus riding out on a donkey. Hosanna! It was a Hillsong concert out there on the side of the mountain. They're saying, Blessed is you. Come to the name of the Lord. And then one week later, crucify! Facebook posts can end a relationship. People are smart, but crowds are stupid. And when you're in a crowd, you may be a smart person, but when you're in a crowd, you're not so bright. When you're in a crowd, you're just not, not so bright. Um, it's amazing how things change based on circumstances, isn't it? I mean, they really don't change, but they appear to. The best food I've ever had in my life my wife and I got married on 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning. We had a reception at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. We got in the car and we're driving away from Hayes, Kansas. And we're going to go to uh, uh, Wichita for the first stop heading south on, on a honeymoon. And we got out of Hayes and we were so hungry. I had eaten that morning. My wife hadn't eaten for like seven days. Because of like that. That's what brides do. Which is insane. Um, and so we, we got to Salina and made the turn heading south. And we just stopped at the first place we found. It was Russell's Truck Stop. They had all-you-can-eat buffet with ribs and mashed potatoes. And, oh, man, I, said, I wasn't even embarrassed anymore. I'm already married. I, I bagged my lemons. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, we're just eating. It's just, oh, it's so good. And the waitress came out and said, y'all celebrating anything? We said, yeah, we just got married. You got married? Three pie. One piece. We had to split it. But three pie. For us. We got down here bloated. Like, oh, that was amazing. You know, We got the car. <laughs> we didn't come back through there for several months. We thought, you know what? Let's do it. We're at the WW six month anniversary. Let's go back to Russell's truck stop. It was butt ugly, nasty food. <laughs> I thought, what happened? You know what happened? We weren't hungry anymore. <laughs> it wasn't that bad, but we had this buildup in our mind that was amazing. It, it just wasn't. You see, the change wasn't what happened out there. The change is what happened. Here. And when you get in the crowd, you can say, I love Jesus, I'll make good decisions, I know what's right, I know what's wrong. When you get in the crowd, it's like standing in an ocean. And those waves, they just push you, push you. And you have to be careful because if you have ever
gone with the crowd, if you have ever buckled under pressure, if peer pressure has not only moved you, but if you've ever used peer pressure to your advantage, you can find your face in the crowd. Now, there's one other character. We have to swing the camera back around. I'd like to take more time with this, but let me bring him into focus. The last guy I want you to look at is Barabbas. And guys, I have a funny story for you. I just want to say, just as much as when I said, Jesus, you're not him, I know you're looking for yourself a story, but I can guarantee you this. You are Barabbas. You want to know why? Because he was guilty. He was convicted. He was condemned. And he was set free. In his place, guilty of murder in the insurrection, not just a rebel, but a murderer, Convicted in the court system, proven, no argumentation. He wasn't fighting it. Condemned. The next step was death row for him. His head was coming off. And with nothing to save him and no reason to call back the verdict, Jesus puts himself in his place. He goes free while Jesus loses his life. And if you understand the gospel story, I just need you to know. We may see a little bit of Pilate. We may see some of the priests. We may find our face in the crowd. But if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you are correct. I got one last thing I want to do, but I need to pray with you first. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for the opportunity to be in the Word. And I pray that as you have revealed, maybe tuck the heart string in us, that you have revealed we can find our face in the story. Let it not just be a moment. Let it be a life change. God, let us be individuals drawn to you in forever different. We love you. We praise you. And we ask that you would continue to move in our lives as we understand we are forever. It's in Christ's name we pray. You are. 
on there. Your response is what? Will you live? 